Senator Joe Manchin, of course, abruptly pulled the plug this week on the Democrats. No, Martha, he didn't abruptly. Pass. Martha, oh, oh, Martha, okay, let, let, me let, okay. he abruptly on Friday. He didn't did abruptly that. do anything. He was he negotiating has sabotaged for a while. the president's agenda. No. Uh, look, if you check the record six months ago, I made it clear that you have people like Manchin, Cinema, Cinema to a lesser degree, who are intentionally sabotaging the president's agenda, what the American people want, what a majority of us in the Democratic caucus want. Nothing new about this. And the problem was that we continue to talk to Manchin like he was serious. He was not. This is a guy who is a major recipient of fossil fuel money, a guy who has received campaign contributions from 25 Republican billionaires. Do you think okay, this guy but, uh, is serious? Senator, I no. want, I, uh, okay, you say he wasn't serious, but Manchin says his main goal is to do what's good for West Virginia, and he's worried about inflation. Listen to what he told really, the West Virginia really? radio station. Listen to this, please. Is that right? Inflation is absolutely killing many, many people. They can't buy gasoline. They have a hard time buying groceries. Everything they buy and consume for their daily lives is a hardship to them. Your reaction to that, Senator? Well, look, the same nonsense the mansion has been talking about for a year. West Virginia, it's a beautiful state. I've had the pleasure of being there. Great people. It is one of the poorest states in this country. You ask the people of West Virginia whether they want to expand Medicare to cover dental, hearing, and eyeglasses. You ask the people of West Virginia whether we should demand that the wealthiest people and large corporations start paying their fair share of taxes. Ask the people of West Virginia whether or not all people should have health care as a human right like in every other country on earth. That's what they will say. In my humble opinion, you know, Manchin represents the very wealthiest people in this country, not working families in West Virginia or America. Sarah Kenzier, the author of the bestsellers The View for Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent, which is available for pre-order now. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And if you're going to be in Washington, D.C. on August 6th, a Saturday evening, there's going to be a free outdoor screening of Mr. Jones on the side of a Russian government building. I kid you not. My new best friend, Benjamin Wittes, is organizing this with his team. Ben has been doing a lot of projections on the side of the Russian embassy in D.C., like the Ukrainian flag. He planted the sunflowers outside of the Russian embassy. And now he's going to scream. He's going to he's going to scream as well as screen Mr. Jones on the side of a Russian government building. And that's going to be followed by a live Q&A with me and Agnieszka Holland, the director of Mr. Jones. And if you're in D.C., come out and watch it. Come out and watch it and watch the Russians squirm as we do this. And also, you could watch it on a live stream anywhere you are in the world. So we'll be live streaming at this. Again, it's happening Saturday night, August 6th, in Washington, D.C., on the side of a Russian government building. And you can watch it on live stream from anywhere. All right. And I encourage you to go, despite the fact that there have been dubious endorsements made from uh, Mr. Wittes, including Bill Barr and Brett Kavanaugh. But Mr. Jones is a very good, solid endorsement. So please go. And as you may have guessed, this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. And today um, we have yet more of our continuing theme of Merrick Garland is a mafia state enabler. Uh, before that, did you have any announcements, Andrea? Um, we sure do. So we're going to be talking a lot more about uh, the burning heat, as you saw, as you heard in our opening clip. Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont was on uh, this week on ABC, calling out Mansion yet again. And then a big reminder: we are taping a live episode of Gaslit Nation on Tuesday, August 9th at 11 a.m. Eastern. And if you want to get access to that, support the show at the Democracy Defender level or higher on Patreon. And we will send out the link where you could watch us, a live taping, followed by an audience Q&A. 
I know we have a lot to talk about. Sarah's going to get into some big stuff. I'm going to get into some big stuff. But first, this deserves a spotlight. We have a chance of expanding the Democratic majorities in both the Senate and holding the House. This is important. There's been news on this. Democrats have raked in massive amounts of donations this year for both House and Senate races, making Republicans very nervous. The more radical Republicans go, the greater the backlash. People are scared. People are angry. The red wave may meet the blue wave this November. So it's important that we each play a part. Join us by making a plan to vote in November and find out ways to get out the vote on the Gaslit Nation 2022 Survival Guide available on our website at gaslitnationpod.com. I've already arranged for childcare on Saturdays in September and October so I can make phone calls to get out the vote on Saturdays through Election Day. I hope you'll join me because this might be the last free and fair, relatively speaking, election we get if we don't turn things around and expand the Democratic majorities in Congress to pass climate emergency legislation, as well as much needed voting rights legislation before the 2024 presidential race. Uh, if you listen to this week's bonus episode available to Patreon subscribers at the truth teller level and higher, we break down all the ways the big North Carolina gerrymandering case the Supreme Court agreed to hear could upend our democracy, allowing for the Fox News Supreme Court to decide our elections. So get involved, stay in the fight, and fight like hell because our votes and voices really do make a difference. Thanks to us getting out the vote, we now have gun safety legislation, a COVID relief bill that put money in people's pockets, big infrastructure legislation was passed that created jobs. A black woman is on the Supreme Court. That's all thanks to our hard work in getting out the vote. And if we expand the Democrats' majorities in the House and Senate, there'll be more good things to come. Vote and uh, keep pressuring everybody to do better. And speaking of that, uh, we have some semi-breaking Merrick Garland, DOJ News. Last night, I was watching TV with my kids when suddenly my phone started going crazy. And there were all these people in my mentions saying, oh my God, oh my God, Sarah Kenzier was right. Oh my God. And I thought, well, what terrible thing has transpired? Because whenever that happens, it's always something bad. And the bad thing was that last night, uh, Rachel Maddow had a segment in which uh, she read a leaked DOJ memo from May 2022 signed by Merrick Garland, uh, basically saying that he's not going to prosecute Trump, uh, you know, and that there were issues regarding the investigation and prosecution of former presidents. This is not entirely new. This is somewhat like the OLC memo uh, debacle that uh, stymied the Mueller probe. This is a memo they did not have to follow. This is not a law we're talking about. We're just talking about norms, uh, which are curiously uh, respected in this case when you're dealing with an actual mafia syndicate threat, suddenly the norms and the protocol, so, so important, uh, so much more important than public safety. Anyway, the thing that really bothered me was the second part where Garland cited Bill Barr, the cover-up general, as William Sapphire called him, because Bill Barr was too devious and uh, Machiavellian, even for ultra-conservatives of the early 1990s, Garland has cited Bill Barr's beliefs on the prosecution of Trump or presidents in general as precedent for his own actions. So Garland is quite clearly taking his cues from Bill Barr, and this is in line with what we have told you many, many times about Merrick Garland and where his loyalties lie, which is, you know, he's often labeled as an institutionalist. And while that is true, what you have to take into account is that the institution which he is protecting is utterly rotted and broken and corrupt and complicit, and it has been so for decades. It was so when Bill Barr was the attorney general the first time around at the end of the uh, George H.W. Bush administration, and it's remained so for decades, and he did not remove the rot. Instead, Garland has contributed to the rot. Um, again, I encourage you to go look at our old episodes. 
Uh, We've discussed how Jamie Gorelick, the deputy attorney general under the Clinton administration who hired Garland and mentored Garland, was herself a protege of Alan Dershowitz, one of the most corrupt lawyers in recent American history. Think of Uh, Jamie Gorelick as the female Alan Dershowitz. Yeah, or the female Roy Cohn. And we've listed her multitude of corrupt endeavors, one of which, you know, this is what's kind of important for the January 6th committee and things going on now is she was Jared and Ivanka's ethics lawyer. Uh, She got them their clearance to the White House. She got Rex Tillerson his clearance, despite uh, his Kremlin ties. And she's also, you know, in addition to being a close colleague of both Garland and Dershowitz, a friend of Bill Barr. They would do things like co-write op-eds together, saying that journalists should be persecuted. And as we mentioned in last week's episode, you may have noticed that the January 6th committee hearings, you know, which we do support on principle because hearings on corruption are good, but they have been used by certain individuals, namely Jared, Ivanka, and Bill Barr, to try to whitewash their own reputations. Now, who is helping to oversee and structure these hearings? Jamie Gorelick. And so we once again see this little corrupt nexus of Garland, Barr, Gorelick, the same people over and over For decades on end, and I'm deeply alarmed by the Bill Barr aspect of this memo. The rest of it is old news. You can seriously go back. We will put all the links to our Merrick Garland-themed show, or you can find them on Twitter. I put them all in uh, interconnected threads to make it easier for everyone to get the information. I'm going to go into uh, the death of Ivana Trump soon, but do you have comments on on this, Andrea? As has been pointed out on this show before, Gorelick was vice chairman of Fannie Mae, And during that time, Fannie Mae had a $10 billion accounting scandal. So it just wherever Graylick goes, there's just a scandal, scandal, scandal. She's like a scandal lawyer, right? Or terrorism with 9-11. That's in another episode. (laughs) Terrorism (laughs) and scandal. She's a a merchant of death in so many ways. Yeah, But uh, Death and destruction. But yes, I think uh, Merrick Garland, that memo that was put out in May, saying essentially that you can't go after Trump unless you get my sign off and their sensitivities when there's an election year. All of that, the fact that he released it right before the riveting high ratings must watch TV of the House hearings, he was trying to get ahead of the public, obviously watching these House hearings and being, where the hell is Merrick Garland? Why hasn't Trump the criminal been indicted? So Merrick Garland was trying to obviously get ahead of that. He knew that the public would be furious once they were reminded and, and, and it was all broken down for them that Donald Trump orchestrated a violent coup attempt against our democracy to literally violently overthrow our democracy. So Merrick Garland was trying to protect Trump. Why would he try to protect Trump? because it's lucrative to try to protect corrupt mafia types. There's a lot of money in that game. There's a lot of power. And it's obvious that Gorelick and and others around them have been profiting from the Trump crime family. We know that directly because, as we keep saying, Gorelick was a lawyer for Jared Kushner. Yeah, so Merrick Garland is either a useful idiot. As Sarah and I always say, they're either dumb or they're evil. (laughs) <laughs> so Merrick Garland is, obviously has some agenda, some motive. He's happy to do it because otherwise Trump would have been indicted by now. Exactly. I, I lean on the side of he's the henchman for evil. He's the hired hand of, of evil. And I have actually a big backstory about this that I'm going to do in a, another episode. I had a lot of time on my hands while Andrea was having a baby and we had our uh, maternity leave slash interview special. But there are other things to discuss. Uh, There is a big story uh, in Trump news this week, which was the death of Ivana Trump, Donald Trump's first wife at age uh, 73. And so I want to talk about that. And the reason I'm talking about it is because we need to establish the difference between a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory, because accusations of, you know, you're a conspiracy theorist and alarmist, et cetera, are often used to shut down what would otherwise be productive conversation and investigation of actual and obvious crimes. And so I'm just going to give some context about this situation. As you likely heard, on July 14th, Ivana Trump was found dead at the bottom of a stairwell in her home on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, 
Within 48 hours, a medical examiner claimed that the cause of death was blunt force injury to the torso. And, you know, that might be true. We do not know how Ivana Trump died. We are journalists and podcasters. We are not coroners. So we don't have any special information here. Ivana Trump's death immediately created a tide of suspicion, particularly since Ivanka and Donald Jr. were supposed to give a long-delayed testimony in court about Trump organization fraud crimes. And as a result of the sudden death of Ivana, that testimony was delayed. And that kind of delay, you know, due to a death in the family, is standard practice in state court. But the thing is, Sudden, violent deaths of people in Donald Trump's inner circle are also standard practice because Donald Trump has been an associate of a transnational crime syndicate for 40 years. And that is why people are suspicious about the death. This is well-merited suspicion based on precedent. People are viewing Ivana Trump's death in the much greater context of Trump's own life his criminal associates, and the body trail that has been left behind him. They are speculating, and in some cases, forming conspiracy theories, because Trump has been implicated in a large number of actual, provable conspiracies, ranging from fraud schemes to attempted coups to mafia activity in which his own lawyer, Michael Cohen, admitted under oath that Trump made him threaten hundreds of people with violence during his brief tenure, relatively brief, working for him. And so there is a great difference between a conspiracy theory that is just based on thin air, pulled randomly from someone's imagination, purely out of malice or or spite, and a theory that is based on evidence and precedent. And it's important to note this remains a theory, and you should not confuse theories with facts but you should also not dismiss theories or facts out of hand just because they make you feel uncomfortable. Instead, just consider the context and look to history as a guide. And as an example of that, I'm gonna give you an abbreviated list of people in Trump's circle who died violent and untimely deaths, usually right about the time that they were proving to be a a problem for Trump or for other members of Trump's crime cult. And this does not mean that Trump killed them or or even had any role in their deaths. I mean, I, I doubt he personally killed anyone because he knows very well how to put distance between himself and his crimes. What we have instead are decades of convenient deaths that shut up both the victims and people who knew the victims who then become afraid to talk. And that is standard mafia fare. That is what happens when your friends and colleagues are in a transnational crime syndicate. And so an abbreviated list here, uh, we have the 1989 helicopter crash of three Trump aides that happened as his casinos were under investigation. At the least, Trump exploited their deaths for publicity, uh, freely admitting that he was doing that, uh, telling wildly inconsistent stories about how that death happened. Those individuals were Stephen Hyde, uh, Mark grossinger Etas, and Jonathan Bananev. Then you have uh, his colleague, Robert Maxwell, falling off a yacht in 1991, maybe suicide, maybe murder. Uh, Maxwell's daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell's partner, Jeffrey Epstein, you know, as we know, uh, quote unquote, committed suicide in prison in 2019. Uh, Epstein had been brought into the world of high society by Bill Barr's father. Uh, there are many connections. We've gone to that before. I'm going to move on. We have the 2017 death of GOP operative Peter Smith, who gave an interview to the Wall Street Journal about how he tried to rig the 2016 election for Trump with the help of Russian hackers. And then, shortly after that interview, Smith was found dead holding a note that said in all caps, no foul play whatsoever, which is totally a normal thing to do when there's no foul play whatsoever. You have a large number of people who handled Trump or or Kushner's or Epstein's finances at Deutsche Bank 
have died in strange ways, including father and son, uh, Bill Brooksmith, and most recently, uh, Valentin Brooksmith. You have Jamal Khashoggi, uh, butchered uh, at the orders of MBS, uh, Biden's new BFF. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi was, of course, a relative of Adnan Khashoggi, who is an associate of Trump and Maxwell. I keep emphasizing this is a transnational crime syndicate. You have Trump's doctor, Harold Bornstein, who forged Trump's certificates of health, uh, found dead with no cause revealed. You have Christine Seymour, died in 1994 in a car crash. Who was she? Well, she was the assistant of Trump mentor Roy Cohn, and she was in the middle of writing a very damning expose about both Cohn and his clients, including Trump. The manuscript was burned after that death. You have dozens of Russian high-level operatives, many of them linked to the 2016 election, uh, who died of heart attacks or falling out a window or murder or other things, or no cause of death listed. This includes Ambassador to the UN uh, Vitaly Cherkin and the Ukrainian Kremlin-tied and Trump-tied millionaire Alex Oronov, both of whom died in 2017. I'm going to stop there. But, you know, there are so many violent deaths linked to Trump and his inner circle, that when I wrote my book, Hiding in Plain Sight, I had to put in a disclaimer when I discussed the death of journalist and Trump enemy Wayne Barrett. I had to specify that Barrett had, by all accounts, died of cancer, because otherwise I think his death would have been viewed as suspicious, because that is precedent. That is what we're dealing with. And so, you know, it's a very bad sign for our nation, that it is actually a normal response to wonder, was Ivana Trump murdered? Or what's the full story here? Or are we getting accurate information? Or can we trust the information that we have been told? Uh, That is the reality that we're dealing with. And so when we talk about stuff like the failure of Garland or other officials to hold this crime cult accountable, it is not at all related to partisan issues. It's related to national security threats and public safety, because we are dealing with people whose lives are drenched in blood and who have left a body trail behind, who have threatened other figures publicly and openly. You know, we saw that in the 2019 uh, impeachment of Trump. All of the individuals who testified were threatened. We're seeing it now with people who are testifying in front of the January 6th committee. Their lives are being threatened. This is very serious. And so, you know, all of this needs to be looked at in the full context. I want to briefly describe uh, what happened to Ivana Trump. Uh, Ivana was both a witness, at the least, to many of Trump's crimes involving uh, financial fraud and casinos, but she was also a victim. And the crimes that Trump committed against her uh, were often kept tightly under wraps from the press, uh, in part because around 2015, Trump dispatched Michael Cohen to threaten any journalist who covers them. And one of the stories they worked hardest to keep under wraps was his alleged violent rape of Ivana, a rape that Ivana confirmed during their 1990 divorce hearings. And then she kind of semi-retracted this claim in 2015, around the time Cohen was threatening everyone, saying she didn't mean he raped her in any, quote, literal or criminal sense. This is worth talking about, both because the crime itself is hideous, and the person that committed it was the president of the United States and could become the president again, but also because the crime and the cover-up reveal a lot about censorship, business, and politics in the late 20th century and today. And so I'm going to talk briefly about a book called Lost Tycoon, The Many Lives of Donald J. Trump, written by Harry Hurt III, published in 1993. And so Harry Hurt III wrote this when Trump had gone bankrupt. He had left Ivana for Marla Maples. This is probably the lowest point of Trump's life, therefore the point where Ivana felt that she could speak most freely. And the book is full of revelations, some of which are serious, some are about Trump being unable to please any woman sexually. Anyway, what is important to know is that in 2016, Harry Hurt III was told by his publisher, Norton, that Lost Tycoon was, quote, too dangerous to remain in print. And Hurt was deeply alarmed by Trump running for office. So he ended up republishing this himself on Kindle simply to get the word out. 
And as I've said before, Trump media coverage is not based on profit motive. It is based on narrative control. Norton, the publisher, could have made a fortune reissuing Hertz's book, but instead they sought to contain its revelations as Cohen and Trump were threatening people. And so what is in the book? Uh, What does it reveal about Donald Trump? I'm going to just read a few passages. It describes, I don't know whether to call this a sex life. It's a it's a rape life, um, just to kind of give you an idea of, you know, this is stuff that was publicly reported about Trump in real time. So just a heads up, I'm going to read a passage from the book about Trump's alleged rape of Ivana. Uh, it's upsetting. So if you need to, please skip ahead about a minute and a half uh, if you want to avoid that. This is a scene where Trump is upset about a scalp reduction treatment he had gotten. He threatens to kill the doctor who does it. He Now I'm just going to read a little from the book. He says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to cost you so much money. I'm going to destroy your practice. Then Donald vents his rage on the person who allegedly got him into this mess in the first place, his wife. Ivana Trump has been relaxing in the master bedroom of the Trump Tower complex. And it goes on to describe from there. It says, Suddenly, Donald storms into the room. He's looking very angry. He's cursing out loud. Your fucking doctor has ruined me, he screams. Donald flings Ivana down on the bed. Then he pins back her arms and grabs her by the hair. The part of her head he is grabbing corresponds to the spot on his head where the scalp reduction operation has been done. Donald starts ripping out Ivana's hair by the handful as if he is trying to make her feel the same kind of pain that he is feeling. Ivana starts crying and screaming. The entire bed is being covered with strands of her golden locks, but Donald is not finished. He rips off her clothes and unzips his pants. And I'm I'm just gonna stop there because this is it's very upsetting to read. This comes from their divorce testimony. And you know, he goes on to say that um, you know, he raped her. He he raped her very violently. And when he was done, it says he glared at her and asks with menacing casualness, does it hurt? There are other examples in the book of um, Trump ordering people to kill for him. One of those involves Trump going uh, through Manhattan with his longtime bodyguard and sometimes chauffeur, Matthew Calamari, who worked for the Trump organization. Um, You know, this is the same uh, body of individuals who are under investigation now uh, by the New York State. Now read a little from here. It says, you'd do anything for me, wouldn't you, Maddie? Donald called from the rear of the limousine. Yes, sir, Mr. Trump, Calamari assured him. Anything at all? Yes, sir, Mr. Trump. Would you kill for me, Maddie? Donald pressed. Yes, sir. Would you kill for me, Maddie? Donald repeated as if he were a cheerleader inciting a crowd to riot. Yes, sir, Mr. Trump. Would you kill for me, Maddie? Donald said again in an even louder voice. Yes, sir, Mr. Trump. See, Donald grinned, turning back towards Fitzsimmons, Maddie would kill for me. So there's that. And then, you know, I was looking through this book after Ivana died because it's one of the most comprehensive sources about their relationship. And I noticed that passage and I was thinking, you know, I've seen Matthew Calamari's name in the news recently. Like, where did I see it? And so I looked it up and it turns out Matthew Calamari Sr., the same person described in this 1993 excerpt that I just read from Lost Tycoon, is standing guard in front of Ivana Trump's building right now, the building where she died, refusing to allow people in with his son, Matt Calamari Jr., who is the director of surveillance at the uh, Trump organization, and that they were allegedly there on the day that Ivana Trump died. So... I'll just leave it at that. It's good to review history. Ah, oh, it's so disturbing. Ivana Trump's death on the eve of the Trump depositions was just chilling. And you had on Twitter the word Epstein trending. Just the fact that given all that we know about this toxic family, that the immediate thought so many of us had was he killed her. He had her killed. If you could violently rape someone you can have someone killed, especially when it's convenient for you, especially when that person has been forthcoming as Ivana Trump has over damning details that give insight into how 
destructive and dangerous you are. It was Ivana Trump that revealed that Donald Trump kept a book of Hitler's speeches by his bedside. That captures everything about this monster. He was a wannabe Hitler with his rallies. He came to power. He ruled using the dictator's playbook of these emotional speeches and scapegoating and overt, proud fascist racism, having his stormtroopers, the Proud Boys and others, building a cult for himself in order to come to power, consolidate power, and attempt, as we saw, to violently try to stay in power. So Ivana Trump hit the nail on the head by revealing to the world that Trump kept a book of Hitler's speeches. And so this is somebody that her death and all the sympathy and the clause that's allowed when you're mourning someone, you, you could push off your legal obligations. They, they took advantage of that, obviously. Well, it's also the children. That it, was, it was Ivanka and Don Jr. that were supposed to, to show up and were excused because, you know, she was their mother. And, you know, somebody asked me about this on Twitter and I said, you know, I obviously don't know the, the particularities of this, but in mafias, in dictatorships, if a criminal body wants to send a message, they don't necessarily target the person that they want to shut up, the person they don't want to say testify or, or speak out or, or whatever. They will target the people closest to them. They'll target family members and they'll send a broader message. They'll say, we will go this far. Human life means nothing to us. And in all those examples of people who were killed, you certainly see this. I mean, I think Jamal Khashoggi is, is a recent one was meant to send a message. The um, you know other recent suspicious deaths, all those Russians, meant to send a message to anyone who witnessed the crimes. Just stay silent because it, you know we might not go after you. We'll go after anybody. We will hurt you any way we can. That is how they operate. And it's, it, it's incredibly frightening. Without question. And Ivanka Trump, from all that we've seen of her, she's just somebody born into and raised in this family. She's just dead inside. When her parents were getting a divorce, one of her biggest concerns were that she could keep the Trump name right? Mm -hmm. She was just brainwashed into that materialistic wealth and greed worship and personal branding cult that her father created. Jared is somebody who, when he talks in his little Weasley voice, it sounds like the mouth of hell opening up. Like, you know, these are just very, very toxic, damaged people from toxic, damaged families. And that's why all of us, when we were stuck under them, when they together ruled the White House and were the most powerful people on the planet enriching themselves to the tune of what hundreds of millions of dollars billions if you want to bring in jared's saudi arabian deals which should be a thing heavily covered by the media and investigated by the doj and it's it's basically going by the wayside because biden is chumming it up with mbs and continuing the uh plot anyway we'll get to that in another episode i think remember how we all felt stuck under this toxic family it was just I will just say, like, I am a very busy person. I've got, I'm juggling a, a million different projects. And I made it a point to go see a therapist during the Trump years because I felt the whole squeeze in my chest. And I felt like a tumor was forming in my brain because his family was just so toxic, right? And, and I remember the therapist and I were, like, helping each other, venting over how toxic this family is and how we were just stuck under them and they're forcing their darkness on us, that, that emotional chest tightening that we're also feeling under the Trumps. It must be pure poison to be part of this family. Uh, it's no secret if you've been in New York long enough that you know that Don Jr. hates his dad, but he doesn't mind using his father to enrich himself and come to power. Um, so yeah, offing the mom when it's convenient for them, she's a drunk anyway, however they see her. That's very much in the realm of possibility when it comes to this disgusting family. Especially with Don Jr., because his connection to Ivana and to Ivana's parents, too, uh, in the Czech Republic, 
was allegedly pretty deep. I think it was, yeah, it was 1990. Vanity Fair did a profile of Ivana and about the Trump divorce. And they interviewed what was then a 12-year-old Don Jr., who flat out told Vanity Fair, you know, he doesn't care about anyone. He doesn't care uh, about me. He doesn't care about our family. He only cares about money. Like, I'm paraphrasing that quote, but, you know, you can look it up. For a 12-year-old boy to say that, you know, to a national magazine, you know, he felt pretty intensely about it. Like, whatever is now in the, the hole that is Don Jr., you know, there was something there. There was a spark of life and love. And, you know, he lived under a father who allegedly beat him. You know, there are reports of that, of Trump hitting him while he was at college, of people witnessing this, abused him. You know, he has a lot of problems. His mother was abused by Trump. I think he he possibly lives in fear. If I were a, a investigator, you know, Don Jr. is who I would kind of look at or talk to because, you know, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's some depth of of humanity there or just a a desire to escape this terrible situation. I don't think that's true with Ivanka. Like you said, I think Ivanka wants to capitalize um, on this situation. But yeah, you know, it's uh, everything about this is, is awful. Like we don't take pleasure in the death of Ivana Trump. You know, we're analyzing it in the context of all of these horrific crimes and suspicious deaths. And we're wishing that we were not, we are not, and we're not living under a mafia state. You know, that is the crux of it. That's why Andrea had to go to a therapist, because that's the reality of it. And we watched it play out for year after year with people constantly denying the severity of that reality and the utter loss of control we had to have any recourse against a mafia state. You know, institutions do not function as they should. Protection is not available. And if you're a journalist, for example, if you're talking about all of this, your own life is always in danger. You know, that that's just the reality of the situation. And it really, it sucks. There's nothing like romantic about this. There's nothing that makes us feel like, wow, we're, we're so brave. We're so enterprising. We would rather be doing something else, like anything else. We would rather be raising our kids in a free and democratic country without constantly having to worry about our personal safety. And so when we cover a story like this, like there's no schadenfreude here. There's only sadness and weariness because of the climate of fear that we and all other Americans are forced to live under, even now, even with the Biden administration, because of the failures of the DOJ and other entities to hold any of these people accountable. Speaking of holding people accountable, we have a segment I'll walk you through on how to get back at Joe Manchin right now. Obviously, we're all going to unite and vote like hell and get the vote out like crazy. And we're going to expand our majority in in the Senate and the House, making Joe Manchin irrelevant. I have so much anger towards this guy. If you've been a longtime listener of the show or you're just paying attention to what's going on, you must as well. He's the worst of the worst. Um, So while the world burns with historic heat waves, thousands of people dying from extreme heat. Joe Manchin decides he's going to let it all burn as long as he dies rich. He goes ahead and does what he does best, and he kills climate action in the Democrats' reconciliation package. As you heard Senator Bernie Sanders say in our opening clip, yes, Biden can pass executive orders, but these don't have the staying power as congressional legislation does. Biden should still pass sweeping and aggressive climate emergency orders as soon as possible. Meanwhile, here's how Manchin sells his soul and our children's future. Uh, Manchin rakes in millions from the apocalypse industrial complex. According to CNN, Manchin has holdings in 2021 that were valued between $1 million and $5 million in Ener Systems, Inc., the coal brokerage business he founded. Between 2011 and 2020, the Democrat made between $4.9 million and $5.1 million from coal-related enterprises. Coal is a dying industry. Manchin is an urgent reminder that congressional ethics rules must be reformed. He is the chairman of the Senate's Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which means he gets to regulate an industry that he personally profits from. That should be illegal. Members of Congress are still allowed to own stock. That too should be illegal. 
until ethic rules are reformed, we're going to continue to have the foxes watching the hen house. Manchin is effectively a coal lobbyist blocking much needed climate change legislation. This guy does not negotiate in good faith, but he's good at stalling for time. Biden and the Democrats are trying to pass a reconciliation package before the midterms while they control both chambers of Congress. This means a very tight vote in the Senate, which needs Manchin support. As part of this package, Democrats wanted to accelerate the transition to renewable energy, including incentives for utilities to switch to clean energy like solar and wind, tax credits for electric cars. It's astounding they can't get a single Republican on board with this to replace Manchin, even though every single state is going to be disrupted by the accelerating climate crisis. Wherever you live in America, wherever you live in the world, listening to this, if you're furious at Joe Manchin, if the name Joe Manchin makes your blood boil like an airport runway in extreme heat, this is how you get revenge on Joe Manchin right now and haunt his nightmares. This is what you do. You contact your local utility company and ask them how your home can switch to being fueled by clean energy whether wind or solar or options. I just did this. My home is now going to be powered by solar. I'm in New York City, so there's plenty of options for this if if you're in New York. If you do not own your own home, ask your landlord if you can make the switch and offer to help your landlord by doing the legwork needed to make the switch. My point is, roll up your sleeves and do what it takes to make sure that wind and solar or any other available renewable resource is fueling your home. It can be done. We have that option, as I said, in New York City for New Yorkers. I'll share a link to check out in the show notes for this week's episode, available as always on the Patreon page for this week's episode. Maybe you have the option where you live and you just need to do some research and make some phone calls to find out. And if you do not have that option, contact your local utility anyway and ask how soon you can have renewable energy as an option, because at least you'll be raising your voice and letting them know that this is what people want. And then contact your local representative, whether they're a Democrat or not, and let them know you would like to stop furthering your own demise and you would like your home to be fueled by renewable clean energy. Make demands, make your voices heard, complain. The change is going to come from us, so keep putting on pressure. The name of the game is to give Joe Manchin climate anxiety. You want Joe Manchin to open his eyes in the middle of the night and see hundreds, thousands of us calling our local utilities to switch to clean energy. It's up to us. I spoke with a college professor recently who engages on a lot of issues of sustainability, and he said companies are largely greenwashing their PR. The changes they've promised to make when it comes to helping the environment are largely just PR. I asked what was needed. He said consumer pressure. Consumers need to put pressure. The market needs to demand changes. Just look at uh, how many fast food chains now are offering fake meat, vegan options. That's because of consumer pressure. So it can be done. So if you want to feel useful right now to take your anger out on Mansion now, switch your home's energy source to renewable energy. And if you don't have that option, then make your voice heard with your local utility company and your local representatives and demand it and ask those around you wherever you live to do the same. As we've said from the start of the show, you can't negotiate with a Confederate statue. And Joe Manchin is a Confederate statue. He cares more about his own personal wealth than human lives. And it's non-white people and poor people, especially poor children, who will be most impacted and displaced by man-made climate change. All people everywhere will be impacted, but rich people who tend to be white due to the system of white supremacy and inherited wealth will have obvious advantages and bracing for impact. It's easier to be a refugee when you have money. You can live in a hotel or in one of the many houses you own instead of a refugee camp or a train station like refugees with lesser means. This point must be underlined. As we're seeing in Ukraine, anyone, anywhere can become a refugee. Those images of refugees we're seeing on the news out of Ukraine, those people are doctors, lawyers, tech executives, athletes, school teachers, small business owners. 
They're regular people from all walks of life. That's what the climate disaster looks like. And when we say poor people and non-white people will have a harder time, it's because they don't have the immense wealth of white people, the ruling white supremacy elites to protect them. But in terms of becoming a refugee, climate change is all about equal opportunity. Anyone can become a displaced person due to climate change. Why? Because the climate science models of prediction are being steamrolled by reality. The planet is heating faster and systems are being disrupted faster than expected. Hurricanes and storms are becoming stronger and more destructive. Fires are becoming more destructive. Floods will increase and impact areas that normally don't see floods. I can't sleep at night because of the climate emergency. So I don't want Joe Manchin to sleep either. Do what you can to try to switch your home's energy to being powered by renewable resources. Now, in a recent New York Times Siena College poll, only 1% of voters offered climate change as their number one concern. The leading concerns of voters are, according to this poll, the obvious ones, the economy and inflation. There's that famous saying when it comes to campaigning, it's the economy, stupid. Everything comes down to the economy. Obviously, if you're struggling on how you're going to get food on the table, how you're going to pay rent, whether you're, you're on the verge of homelessness, when you're fighting for survival, the immediate threats are obviously going to be your number one priority. And so many people are vulnerable right now. But before political leaders take this polling to dismiss climate change as a key issue, they should take into account that, I'm going to quote now from Harvard Health Publishing, according to a survey by the American Psychological Association, more than two thirds of Americans experience some climate anxiety. A study published by The Lancet found that 84% of children and young adults ages 16 to 25 are at least moderately worried about climate change and 59% are very or extremely worried. So in general, two thirds of Americans experience some climate anxiety and the next generation of voters are also extremely worried. So guess what, politicians? If you want people to knock on doors for you, to make phone calls for you, to move mountains, getting out the vote, speak clearly and with moral leadership when it comes to the climate emergency. The majority of Americans experience climate anxiety. That's motivation. The economy is always a leading factor in elections, but it's firing up the base that can make all the difference in an election, especially a close one. So don't lose sight of the fact that the climate emergency is the number one issue. The climate crisis is disruptive across all industries, all walks of life. In the UK, for instance, you see the British Royal Air Force had to stop flights out of its largest air base because the runway had melted in extreme heat. That extreme heat is only going to get worse. The climate crisis is an international security crisis. The Pentagon knows this. They released a report on it that was apocalyptic. Also, all the oil and gas that we're consuming that's destroying the planet, that oil and gas, that's paying for Russia's war crimes in Ukraine. Russia continues to deliberately target civilians because it's a terrorist state, right? And Russia released a report saying that a warming planet is a good thing for Russia because it's going to melt the ice in Siberia and Siberia will then be turned into farmland for Russia to exploit. I kid you not. Russia wants climate change so that it can turn Siberia into a breadbasket of Europe. The idiots there don't understand how extreme heat, flooding, extreme drought, extreme storms will mess with those plans. So Russia continues to rake in billions from oil and gas, using that money to fuel its war machine, committing genocide in Ukraine. And Joe Manchin is empowering all that. Joe Manchin and his financial backers are fueling Russia's war machine by preventing America from taking any meaningful action right now on the climate emergency. We need to make oil and gas obsolete. We need to accelerate our transition to renewable energy. We're not moving fast enough. And in the meantime, we're empowering mass murdering psychopathic dictators like Putin. Yes, economic uncertainty and inflation brought on by that pandemic and made even worse by Russia's genocidal war are scary but we need to weather this storm and demand we move faster in our transition to renewable energy. We're all being called to meet this moment. There's so much at stake at this dangerous crossroads we're all facing now. We're going to end this show with a clip of Jan Stoltenberg, 
the former prime minister of Norway for the Labour Party and the current secretary general of NATO speaking to the European Parliament. The euro currently is getting battered. The euro and the dollar are now equivalent, which is huge. Um, Europe is paying a big price in the energy hit that it's taking and trying to wean itself off of Russian oil and gas. This is a problem of Europe's own making. They should have been paying attention all this time on how Russia was abusing its own people, abusing its neighbors. They should have never relied on a terrorist state like Russia for its energy. But unfortunately, the policy across Europe was disastrous appeasement led by Angela Merkel of Germany. Under Merkel, Germany became further dependent on Russian energy. And now here we are. Europe created this crisis for themselves and now they're forced to pay the price. It is a reminder to all of us that we we have to have moral leadership. You cannot trust or do business or let in terrorists of any kind, whether it's a terrorist lawyer like Jamie Graylick or a a mass murdering terrorist like Putin. We have to draw the line and we have to enforce those lines or else that's it. The price of not supporting them is much higher. Partly because for me, this is a moral issue. This is about a sovereign, independent nation with more than 40 million people living in Europe, which is brutally attacked by a big power, Russia. If we don't react to that, and after we have seen what happened in Budja and other places, it, it violates my understanding of, what to say, decent behavior of neighbors and friends of Ukraine. So, of course, yes, it has a price, but not to act and just let that brutality continue and let that brutality of Russia be awarded is for me a higher price. Second, it is in our interest to help Ukraine because you have to understand that if Ukraine loses this, that's a danger for us. That will make Europe even more vulnerable for Russian aggression because then the lesson learned from Georgia in 2008, from annexing Crimea in 2014, from starting to undermine Donbass in 2014, and then the full-fledged brutal invasion by President Putin in February, is that they can just use force. They get their will. It's to re-establish an idea of spheres of influence, where big powers can decide what smaller neighbors can do. And that will make all of us more vulnerable. So even if you don't care about the moral aspect of this, supporting the people of Ukraine, you should care about your own security interests. So therefore you have to pay. Pay for the support, pay for the humanitarian aid, pay the consequences of, of the economic sanctions, because the alternative is to pay a much higher price later on. And then remember one thing, yes, we pay a price, but the price we pay as the European Union, as NATO, is the price we can measure in currency, in money. The price they pay is measured in lives, lost every day. So we should just stop complaining and step up and provide support, full stop. Our discussion continues and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We encourage you to help support Ukraine by donating to Rosam for Ukraine at rosamforukraine.org. Do not donate to the Red Cross because your money will never reach Ukraine for the most part. Please donate locally. And Rosam for Ukraine is an organization that works there on the ground. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at the orangutanproject.org and check the products you buy for palm oil. And don't buy them anymore. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Our production manager is Nicholas Torres, and our associate producer is Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Vissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. 
Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. If you do not hear your name here, and you should, then just send us a quick message on Patreon. We've had a very intense maternity leave, so we appreciate your help. Uh, thank you so much to all of our supporters. So let us know if your name is missing, and we'll quickly add you to the list. So thank you very much to Eric Coffin, Jess Sauer, Chick Quinn, Lily Wachowski, Sean Rubin, Todd S. Perlstein, Pat, Kenny Maine, John Schoenthaler, Ellen McGurk, Joel Ferran, Larry Gasson, Erica Moore, Karen A. Deal, Nico Phillips, Brian E. Castor, Tatiana Birch, Karen Heisler, Ann Bertino, Chris Bravo, T.R. Dunstan, John Millett, David East, Stu, Shannon Nacy, Ida, Ben Wheaton, Joseph Mara Jr., Rich Holcomb, Thomas Scheibeth, Kelsey Molsom, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Mark Mark, Barbara Kittredge, Matthew Womack, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hattrick, Irv Robinson, William Barry Reeves, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Mike Christensen, Sandra Collins, Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, Carol Golstad, Michael Woldridge, Jason Benke, Marcus J. Trent, Joe Darcy, Ann Marshall, Jeremy Lewis, Jill Newman, Trigve, D.L. Singfield, Matt Perez, Nicole Sphere, Brian Tajudin, Maureen Murphy, Michelle Dash, Abby Road, Jans Alstrup Rasmussen, Victoria Olson, ZW, Lisa Laflame, Jason Bainbridge, Sarah Gray, Mike Tripico, Diana Gallagher, Jennifer Ann Luter, John Ripley, Man, Pierre Itzma, David Porter, Kate Cotton, Leah Campbell, Lynn Schneider, Eric Lombardo, Karen Humphreys, Ann Marshall, Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support of the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Mm-hmm.